2021 Emotional Support Animal Letter Update. We are doing this webinar because we did a webinar in 2018 where we covered emotional support animals, but there have been changes in law since then. So we want to make sure that uh, we give you those changes in law um, because if you do things the way that you used to do them before these changes in law, then you're going to be doing them wrong. So we're hopeful that this presentation will be helpful in clarifying some things. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with MBFE, we are a national not-for-profit board that provides training and certification for forensic evaluation. So we hope you will check us out at mbfe.net if you aren't already familiar with us. The most popular question for any webinar is how do I get the handouts? You get the handouts by clicking on this link. We're going to put it into the chat box also. And the link is integritycounseling.box.com slash V as in Victor slash ESA for emotional support animals dash handouts. So you can click on that link and you will be able to access all of the handouts, including everything that you see on the slides. So you don't need to take any notes on the slides or anything. You can just sit back, enjoy the information, participate as you like, and you will have everything that you see on the slides later on in a PDF format, including hyperlinks to anything that you see like this that is red and underlined. You can click on it and go directly to the source of information. But you could send an email to this email address here if you have questions that we didn't get to today. That will be me at anorton.com. That's M-E at anorton.com. Oh. What we're going to be covering today is an overview of the law as it relates to emotional support animals. And we'll talk about ethical practices and clinical guidelines. These three arenas are distinct and different arenas, but they all share a common thread. Um, so there's some overlap between all three, but as you know, What's legal is not always the same as what's ethical. Generally speaking, legal guidelines are like a minimal standard. And then ethical guidelines typically, and, and clinical guidelines are good practice, are going to go above and beyond what the law requires in most cases. So today we'll look at what's legal about, what the law says about ESA letters, but we're also gonna be looking at ethical practice and clinical practice. Also, I'm hoping that you'll find this webinar helpful regardless of whether you are a clinician that prim primarily does therapy with clients or whether you are a forensic evaluator whose job is to conduct evaluations for the courts. Because um, in both scenarios, you could find yourself being involved with ESA letter scenarios. Also, you know how it's um, a good ethical practice to put disclosures up front when you are providing any kind of training. I don't have any financial connection to anything that, that you will see in these slides. Um, the only thing I have a financial connection to is the National Board of Forensic Evaluators. And there's nothing we're selling <laughs> in conjunction with the information you'll see in today's presentation or anything. But I do love animals, and we're talking about animals today. So on the left-hand side, you will see a ridiculously adorable picture of a dog who is lying right next to me right now, um, who I think is insanely cute. But uh, that's the closest thing to a disclosure that I have today. Now, <clears throat> would love to start off by getting a pulse of who's out there and what's going on with all of you today with some polling questions. Oh. Let's see who's out there. Numbers are stabilizing, it looks like. The majority of you are counselors. We also have a good number of social workers with us today. It's like um, at least one psychologist and psychiatric nurse practitioner, probably a couple of them, actually. Oh. Some people are responding to this question in the actual chat box instead of using polling questions, which is okay if you want to do it that way. And a couple people in the chat box said that they have gotten 10 ESA letter requests. Kind of interesting. I've seen such a wide range in like the number of messages that people get or the number of ESA letters that uh, people get. But what we see on the screen here is everywhere from zero to as much as 15, it looks like. The larger the number, by the way, the greater the number of people who sent that number in on the polling question. 
Oh, and um, Mariella says that uh, there was about 20 different requests received by Mariella. So actually, Mariella gets the greatest number of ESA letter requests award, it looks like, with this polling question. And it looks like most of you did not attend that webinar, which is really good for me to know. That means I'm not going to just gloss by some of the stuff that we did in our 2018 version, assuming that people are familiar with it. But I will uh, make sure that we do due diligence and covering um, the, uh, everything that was in the 2018 version as well as we go through here. One of the other things that we did is today's webinar is actually longer than the one we did in 2018, just to make sure that we're providing adequate time for everybody to get the information they need. And it looks like, you know, roughly half of you that have responded so far are either certified forensic mental health evaluators or you're pursuing the CFMHE credential. Three people in the text box have chimed in and said um, no. And Mariella is a forensic psychologist, but is not certified. Okay, therapeutic benefit of emotional support animals. There's a couple of ways we can talk about the therapeutic benefit. There is kind of a scarcity of research on emotional support animals. There is some research though, and you can certainly look that information up, but at the same time, there's a different way we could do this than look up a bunch of boring journal articles about uh, any therapeutic benefit of emotional support animals. And this is one other way to do it. What do you notice within yourself as you look at all of these pictures? Some people are chiming in in the chat box and saying extreme feelings of joy and warmness. And joy is a good word because Remember, the larger the word, the greater the number of people that are expressing that particular word. So lots of people are saying joy. We got happy smile, warm and cuddly in the chat box. We have fuzzies, awe, heart, happy, sweet, compassion, happiness, opening, warmth, nurtured, nostalgic, warm, smile, and yummy. <laughs> All right. And the words keep coming in. But I didn't see anything on here like stressed, annoyed, irritated, frustrated, anxious, nothing like that. So maybe this is just a shortcut version to say, I think we can all acknowledge that there's something to this whole, you know, human pet bond or human animal bond that seems to generate some feelings of warmth and some calm and some happiness. We probably don't need um, a uh, well-designed study to tell us about that. Um, so that's one way to talk about the therapeutic benefit of animals. Now, of course, the question about whether animals are therapeutic, at least for some people, or whether we find pictures of them um, really cute and endearing is a different question then the question that we're going to be answering with ESA letter requests. And now we're going to start to get into the law. What does the law say about emotional support animals? So first polling question about ESAs and the law. So hopefully what you're also seeing here is there's a lot of variation in your answers, right? Some of you think it's only housing. A lot of you, in fact, the most popular option was both air travel and housing. And a, a good amount of you think all three contexts and then about 15% say employment and housing. So it's quite a spread that we have here. And I think this is a good illustration for why this training is a good idea. 
because you can't all be right in this case. There is only technically one right answer on the screen, and you're going to know exactly what it is in just a moment here. So on that note, let's begin, though, with a few different definitions. We have emotional support animals. We have service animals. There's also something called therapy animals or therapy dogs. And what are, what are the similarities and differences between these different things? And how do you tell them apart? That's kind of the big question, right? Because you kind of have to know what an emotional support animal is before we start looking at the law and ethics and clinical practice guidelines that connect to emotional support animals, right? So let's begin with the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is your primary piece of legislation that affects people with disabilities in the work environment and employment scenarios. So this is a good place to begin with, right? There are other laws that affect, you know, um, provide protections for people with disabilities in the workplace, like the Rehabilitation Act, for example, but the ADA is the big one that deals with discrimination, especially. Here, we see that dogs and miniature horses that are individually trained to do work or perform tasks for people with disabilities are service animals, and that emotional support animals are not service animals. So there's a difference between the two. This is what a service animal is. This animal has to be a trained professional performing a task for somebody with a disability. ESAs, on the other hand, don't have to be trained on anything. They provide companionship, they relieve loneliness. They sometimes help with depression or anxiety or phobias, but they don't have any special training to perform tasks that assist people with disabilities. So an ESA is like its very presence is ameliorating to the person with the disability, but it's not a trained professional. A service animal is not a pet. A service animal is a trained professional animal that um, is trained to perform certain tasks or duties on the behalf of the person with a disability. Now, some people erroneously say that service animals, um, if somebody has a mental health condition, then they don't have a service animal, it's an ESA. That's not necessarily true. There are service animals that are trained to help people with psychiatric conditions or mental health disorders. A good example of this is, let's say that you had a veteran who was involved in maybe the war in Iraq or Afghanistan, and they developed PTSD, and they went through a period of time where they were avoiding going out into the open or being in public spaces, and loud sudden sounds can be very troubling. They have maybe a hyper startle response, and they're hyper vigilant. They've also, maybe they live in New York City, and you do a lot of walking on the street or on the sidewalks in New York City. And if somebody turns a corner all of a sudden, then it um, alerts them sometimes and they maybe ball up a fist. And, um, and so what they've done is um, started avoiding being out in public. Well, there are service animals that are trained to do things like create a certain distance, a space between the front of the person and others. And when they're approaching a corner, the animal will look around the corner first and then signal to the owner or actually to the individual with the disability um, if there's somebody coming around the corner. There, and there are service animals that are even trained to sense a panic attack that's either happening or is coming on. And when they sense that panic attack, they're trained to approach the individual with the disability in a certain way and then provide some form of a holding technique or a bonding technique or um, a way to sort of calm or soothe the person with the disability. Now, for some of you who haven't seen that in action yet, you may wonder what the heck I'm talking about. I've seen animals trained to do some of these things and it's a pretty impressive thing to watch. 
So there are service animals for people with mental health conditions. Um, that certainly does exist, but remember, ESAs are not service animals because they're not trained to perform functions related to ameliorating the person's impairment related to their disability. Uh, it's their mere presence is what is thought to be what relieves symptoms for the person, for an ESA. The bottom line is the ADA doesn't protect ESAs. So what that means is if you have an ESA and you bring your ESA to work and your employer says, mm, we don't allow animals in here, you don't get to say that they violated the ADA um, because that animal is an emotional support animal and the ADA doesn't protect ESAs. The ADA only protects service animals. So there's an important distinction throughout the law, both federal and state, between ESAs and service animals in most contexts. But there are some exceptions too. We'll talk about that in a minute. Under the ADA, by the way, service animals, you know, public accommodations have to modify their practices to accommodate the presence of the animal. And um, there are some exceptions. If the animal's out of control and the animal's handler does not take effective action to control it, or if the animal's not housebroken, those can be exceptions. If, if though, an employer says, sorry, you can't have your service animal in here because of one of these two things, then the employer has, or the, I mean, sorry, not the employer, but then the, the, um, the service or place of business has to do what it can to still get the individual with the disability the opportunity to obtain good services and accommodations. So let's say that you had a service animal and you walked into a Sam's Club with that service animal, but that service animal was strangely not um, behaving well or you couldn't control it, or maybe it went to the bathroom in the store and essentially got kicked out because of that. Then Sam's Club still has to figure out how do we get you your groceries? That might be that you know, you're outside and the groceries are brought to you. It might be nowadays that they're delivered to your home, but the law really says they still have to figure out a way to get you access, even if uh, the animal can't be inside the store. But generally, you're not going to see that. Every service animal I've ever seen is very well behaved and well trained and is housebroken. I haven't seen an exception yet myself, but I'm sure it happens once in a while out there somewhere. I think the bigger problem is when people have an ESA, and they try to say that it's a service animal, but it's clearly not. You can tell from the way it behaves and interacts, which raises a question. How does a place know if the animal is a service animal or an ESA? Is it just the word of the individual with the disability? Or is there some other way that they can differentiate between the two? Well, that brings us to um, the questions that you're allowed to ask. You can ask questions like, is this your pet? If it's their pet, it's not a service animal. And you can ask, what service is the animal trained to provide? You can't ask what disability um, the animal, uh, what disability the animal is trained to help with. You're not allowed to ask that, but you can add, or, but you can ask what service the animal is trained to provide from an ADA perspective. So if I'm an employer and I have an employee and they're saying that this dog is a service animal. These are examples of questions I can't ask, but um, the same would apply for if I am a store owner, um, I own a convenience store maybe, and somebody comes in with an animal and um, they're saying that this animal is a service animal. I could ask these questions as part of my process of trying to determine is this really a service animal or not. Now then, the animal has to be under the handler's control, and that means there has to be a harness, a leash, or some other tether. Um, that's part of it anyway, um, of being able to demonstrate that the animal's under control. So if somebody walks in with a lizard on their shoulder, 
That is not a service animal for a couple of reasons. One is it's not a dog or a miniature horse. The second is it's not under the handler's control by this definition of being under control. There's no harness, leash, or tether. But probably also I'd have a hard time believing that that lizard is trained to perform any duties on the part of the person with the disability um, to compensate for some functional impairment of some kind. So you're not allowed to ask about the nature or extent of the person's disability, and but you can inquire um, about whether the animal qualifies as a service animal in other ways. You can ask if the animal is required because of a disability, and you can ask what work or task the animal's been trained to perform, and kind of variations of those two questions. You want to be careful about getting um, too creative with those variations. You also cannot require documentation. So there is no national registry of service animals that is required by the federal government, for example. Yes, there are private companies that say we are the official U.S. service animal registry that you can pay to have an animal on, and yet it doesn't mean anything um, to anybody who knows the law because the federal government doesn't have a registry and um, you're not allowed to ask for any documentation anyway um, that a service animal is a, that an animal is a service animal. You can only assess in sort of a common sense way using these questions that we've talked about here. So <laughs> that's crazy. We're just supposed to trust someone's word that they're certified um, in the chat box. Um, well, no, because there's no certification. <laughs> that's the other thing. So it's not even that. We can't even ask them, is this animal certified? All we can do is ask them, you know, is this animal trained to perform, um, you know, a duty because of a disability? Is this animal a pet? You know, those kinds of questions. And if the animal's not behaving itself or it's not housebroken or the handler doesn't have control of the animal or the animal is anything but a dog or a pony, or I'm sorry, not a pony, a miniature horse, then you already know that it's not a service animal um, by this definition of, in the law. Now, I'm not an attorney and I'm not, you know, my perspective is not any kind of a suitable replacement for an attorney's advice, but seems awfully clear when we look at the law, um, what it is that we're allowed to do or not do, and also a little fuzzy at the same time, because like in the chat box, I would agree it's kind of not a whole lot that you can do to differentiate between them. Maybe it would be helpful if there was something like an official federal government registry or something. But also remember, that would be a pain in the butt for people with disabilities that have legitimate needs of service animals. Um, and there's this balancing act that the government tries to do between not making things too hard for people with legitimate disabilities to access what they need to access on one hand, but also having some order to things and preventing abuse of the legislation on the other hand, and it's a tricky balance. I do not have the answers, but I can tell you the way it looks, the way it is right now. Um, and this is what the ADA says. Um, that being said, you also can't pay the person or charge the person with a disability some kind of a surcharge because they've got a service animal involved. So like Sam's Club cannot say, all right, if you're bringing a service animal in, here's a fee that you have to pay. And they can't, um, no place of business can add money to what they're charging because you're using a service animal. So let's just differentiate a few things here. And some of this kind of skips ahead that you see on this chart because we're going to go over some of this in greater detail. But we've got a comparison chart here of three different types of animals. We've got service animals on the left, therapy animals in the middle, and emotional support animals on the right. So what we see here, uh, oh, Carol says only the letter is sufficient documentation. Well, to clarify, Carol, for service animals, which is all that we've really, is, which is primarily what, we've been, what we were just talking about, service animals and the ADA, there is no such thing as a letter even. 
So if I have a service animal and I walk into Sam's Club, they can't ask me for a letter. They're not allowed to do that. So there is no documentation and there is no certification. Now I might have a letter and I might say, look, I've got a letter from, you know, Bob's um, service animal shop online. I, I might offer them documentation if I want to, but they can't ask for anything. And there is no like federal government documentation, official registry or something of a service animal. There are lots of private companies out there that offer all kinds of fancy looking badges and seals and letters and certificates and vests and all kinds of things. And yet none of that is required by law. But there are letters for ESAs in other contexts. So we will get there. I know um, Christine and, and Carol are like, um, well, we're talking about ESAs here. Um, so we're going to get there. Just hold on to it. We're going to get to ESAs and letters because there are letters for ESAs that are required in some contexts. So we'll, we'll get there soon. But for now, um, the overview part is service animals covered by the ADA, therapy animals are not, emotional support animals are not. Now, service animals have to be able to tolerate a wide variety of experiences. They have to be very resilient. They have to be able to move around with the person with a disability in certain contexts and be adaptive. So they got to be trained. So do therapy pets. A therapy pet might be brought into a hospital, for example, um, to interact with children on the children's uh, in the children's unit. Well, that therapy animal has to be able to tolerate a lot of variety of experience. A therapy animal might be brought into a school in the weeks following the aftermath of a school shooting. That therapy animal has to be able to interact with crowds and large numbers of people and strangers and things like that. ESAs don't have to. ESAs are about one person. Service animals are about one person, but the service animal has to be able to um, be trained to interact in a variety of contexts and scenarios, and so do therapy animals. ESAs don't. Um, service animals can live with their disabled owner even if there's a no pets policy in place. So now we're talking about housing, right? Housing does not protect therapy animals. Therapy animals are generally going to be for groups of people. Therapy animals are brought into retirement homes. They're brought into hospitals. They're brought into schools. Um, so they're, uh, they're there to provide a therapeutic presence for a large number of people that can maybe walk up and pet them and things like that or groom them for a moment. But there's no protection for them in housing. There is a protection for ESAs in housing as Christine and Carol and others have pointed out in the chat box. So this is the first place where we do see there is a protection for ESAs. They can indeed be protected in housing. We'll talk all about that in a few minutes. For a service animal, the primary function is not to provide emotional support through companionship. No, they are trained to perform duties observable behavioral duties on the behalf of the person with the disability to compensate for their functional impairments. Therapy animals are also not there to provide emotional support to a particular individual through companionship. They're more there like for the group. And then emotional support animals, on the other hand, are the only ones that that is what their job is supposed to be. They are supposed to just provide emotional support through companionship for a particular person with a disability, an individual person. Service animals are specially trained to assist just one person. Therapy animals and emotional support animals are not because they don't need to have training. Therapy animals have to have a very good temperament, um, but they don't need to have training necessarily. And then finally, um, the only one of these three different categories that is designed for groups of people is therapy animals. Remember, so when you think of, oh, isn't that nice? Someone's bringing a cuddly, nice dog into the retirement home for everybody to pet and groom and, 
um, well, that's a group of people. So that's probably a therapy animal. When you see a dog that looks like it's very serious and it's about the business and it's well-trained and it's performing duties and it kind of, then that's probably a service animal. And typically they are wearing some kind of a vest or something, but that's not required. When you see an animal that looks like it's just a pet and it may have a fancy vest and everything, but it's really looking like it's just a pet there to they're interacting with its owner. That's probably an emotional support animal. Those are just rules of thumb. So Gail is also chiming in about the good state of Georgia here. Here in Georgia, um, apartments and universities, a person who brings in an ESA against the pet policy will be evicted. Had several cases already. Well, that, that may be happening, but federal law does protect ESAs in housing. I would assume that the scenarios that you're talking about, Gail, either somebody violated the law, the federal law, like the whoever evicted the person violated federal law, or the person with the disability didn't do their due diligence. And um, sometimes this happens where somebody's ESA somebody gets evicted because they bring an ESA into an apartment and it ends up in court. We will actually tell you about a real court case here in Florida where this happened, where um, somebody got, um, got the boot pretty much for having an ESA and they had a letter from a mental health professional and the court actually sided not with the person with the disability, they sided against the person with the disability. But the reason why is because that person did not follow the law. Actually, even worse, the mental health professional did not follow the law who was involved. So we're going to talk all about that. This will become clear when we get to the process for housing and DSAs. But first, let's talk about the Air Carrier and Access Act. So notice in that last chart that we just showed you, nothing on there about air travel. So this is a big difference between when we did this webinar in 2018 and today, because the law was revised in December 2020 so that effective in the year 2021, federal law no longer requires airlines to treat emotional support animals as service animals. Okay, so let me just make this very clear. What this means is no air carrier, Delta, United, American Airlines, whoever, none of them are required to, a, to treat an emotional support animal the same way that a service animal is treated. There's no unique special protection for ESAs and air travel anymore. There used to be though. And in fact, what this law said prior to 2021, it said that it threw ESAs into the service animal definition in this law. Unlike the ADA, the Air Care and Access Act used to say that, by the way, emotional support animals are service animals too. Uh, and so because of that, tons and tons and tons and tons of letters being written for people to allow their emotional support animal to be on the plane without getting any charge for it, um, just like somebody who has a service animal would. That is no longer the case though. So all of you who, who said in the polling question that ESAs are protected under federal law for air travel, um, it is good for you to know about this, that no longer is that the case. So it's only service animals now that federal law protects as far as air travel goes. A service animal in that context is going to be a little bit different than the ADA definition, but it's not going to include ESAs. It means a dog. So no miniature horses, that's one difference. In the ADA, a miniature horse can be a service animal, but on the Air Care and Access Act, a miniature horse is not defined as a service animal. It's dogs only. Doesn't matter what breed or type, doesn't matter if it's a Doberman Pinscher or a cute little annoying Chihuahua, but it's regardless of breed or type, but that animal has to be individually trained to work on to work or perform tasks for the benefit of the qualified individual with a disability. So it specifically says now 
that animal species other than dogs, emotional support animals, comfort animals, companionship animals, and service animals in training are not service animals for the purposes of this part. So they are completely excluded from this law now. That's the big, giant, huge, big difference since we did this training in 2018. And that changes a lot of the things that we were training you for in 2018, because we were training you about what does the law say about ESAs and the Air Carrier Access Act. And there were a lot of requirements and how do you make sure all those requirements are met? And what does your letter have to have in it? All of that's out the window now because there no longer are any protections for ESAs on air travel. Now, I do wanna say one thing though, that doesn't stop an airline from saying, we want to allow ESAs to be treated the same as service animals, so we choose to. They can still choose to, just like Sam's Club can choose to allow Noah's Ark to come into their business if they want. Um, it's more, what does the law protect? What does the law require? And my experience is all the major airlines don't allow ESAs anymore to be treated as service animals. They're, most of them are choosing not to because there's a reason why the law changed. We're gonna get to that in a moment. There's a reason for it. It didn't just change willy nilly, but a lot of stuff went down that led to this protection being removed for 2021 on. We'll get to all that. We will cover it. Let me see, nothing, uh, let's see. I think it was because so many people were abusing it, Mark says. And that is the very short and concise version, Mark. Absolutely. So air carriers, now they do need, now you might have clients who have a psychiatric service animal, for example. So it's still good to know what the Air Carrier Act says about service animals. They must allow a service animal to accompany a passenger with a disability. They can't deny transportation to a service animal. They can't say, oh, your, your service animal is a Rottweiler and we think Rottweilers are mean, so you can't have it here. They can't do that. But, and then what can they do to determine if an animal is a service animal? This is kind of also important to you because you may have clients who try to masquerade their ESA as a service animal. Because remember, there's no like official registry or something like that. So you might have a client who, who really has an ESA and they try to bring the ESA on a plane and say, uh, you know, this is a service animal. So what is the air carrier allowed to do under this law? They can ask if the animal is required to accompany the passenger because of a disability, and they can ask what work or task the animal has been trained to perform. So if the answer is my animal has been trained to fetch or to look cute or, um, you know, or to play dead, <laughs> those things would be pretty hard to connect to um, a disability related task a task that, I guess, fetch actually would be an exception to that, because what if you had a physical impairment that made it hard for you to get up and grab things, and the animal brings things to you? So actually, remove fetch from that list, but playing dead, I don't see how that would in any way be a task that um, an animal is trained to do that would help with a disability. Um, so you kind of get the picture here. They cannot ask about the nature or extent of the person's disability, and they cannot even ask for a demonstration. So if the person says, yeah, you know, uh, this animal is trained to bring items to me that I cannot, because of a disability, um, obtain myself, they can't ask, well, show us. Here's a ball. Um, have that dog bring you that ball. They can't do that. They can't ask for a demonstration. So it's really just the person's word so far, right? Now, what they also can do besides asking those questions is they can observe the animal's behavior. So if the animal runs freely around, barks or growls at people, and of course, if it bites or jumps on somebody or injures somebody, if it urinates or defecates in a cabin or gate area, all of those things are examples where the air carrier can say, mm, no, service animal or not, we're not allowing this animal to be on the plane. They can, they can look for physical indicators like, is there a harness or a vest? So do, is the animal under the handler's control or not? They can require that the service animal be harnessed, leashed, or otherwise tethered at all times. 
and they can limit a passenger to two service animals max so that one person doesn't bring Noah's Ark onto the plane. But you kind of see here, it still is kind of fuzzy sometimes, right? Is this a service animal? Is it not? For me, when I go to an airport and I see some dog sitting there acting like a pet, I assume it's not a service animal. Um, service animals, in my experience, are they're almost stoic looking. They are so, they are prim and proper service animals. They are trained and they're not interacting with people. They're not, you know, wagging their tail and licking things and getting all excited over stuff. Service animals don't do that stuff in my experience. But again, that's just a rule of thumb. It's not an exact science. This is what the air carriers are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do, what you see on the screen here. Now, can a carrier require documentation? There actually is some documentation they can require in this context of air travel. They can require the passenger to provide a current USDOT animal air transportation form. And it has to have been completed either on or after the date of the purchase of the airline ticket. So if the form is filled out before the ticket was bought, then it doesn't, it doesn't count. If the flight is scheduled to take eight or more hours, they can require the passenger to attest that the animal will not need to relieve itself or that it could do so without any health or sanitation issue. And there's a separate form for that because it's the federal government and they like forms. So you not only have an animal air transportation form, but you also have an official animal relief attestation form. So they can require that form if it's a flight of eight hours or more. If the flight was booked more than 48 hours in advance, then the air carrier can require the passenger to give 48 hours advance notice by submitting those forms and declaring their intent to travel with a service animal. So if I book, if I buy a ticket today for a flight in three days, then, and I try to show up with a service animal without having completed, submitted those forms 48 hours prior, then they can say, sorry, the animal can't travel with you. Except, no, that's not really true. Making that point almost kind of moot. Because then look at this. If the flight was not booked more than 48 hours in advance, then they still have to provide the accommodation anyway, as long as they can do so by making reasonable efforts and without delaying the flight. So it kind of makes the forms a little bit less impactful when they have this part right here. The air carrier would have to show, well, if we let you bring the same on the plane, we're gonna to have to delay the flight. Well, um, if it's a chihuahua, how, how is letting a chihuahua on the plane gonna delay the flight, you know? So I would still, if you had a client that has a legitimate service animal, I would still make sure they know that they need to submit these forms in advance so that they don't have to run into the possibility though that an air carrier would turn them down at the time of their flight. So air travel, that's about it for air travel then. Remember no ESAs um, protected under air travel anymore. They're treated just like any other um, pet. So it doesn't mean you can't bring an ESA onto a plane. That, that flight may have a policy that either says, hey, we do provide a special accommodation for ESAs because we choose to, or they may just treat the ESA as any pet and say, okay, here there's an extra charge for bringing this animal on or you know, any other rules that they have that apply to when somebody tries to travel with the pet could be applied for an ESA. With that being said, let's move on to Fair Housing Act. Because remember, the laws are different depending on the context. So what does the Fair Housing Act say? Well, it says it has a term called an assistance animal. All right, so here's a new word, assistance animal, right? What is an assistance animal? Well, it's an animal that works, provides assistance, or performs tasks for the benefits of a person with a disability. That sounds a lot like a service animal, doesn't it? Or it can be an animal that provides emotional support that alleviates one or more identified aspects of a person's disability. That sounds like an emotional support animal, right? So in other words, both service animals and ESAs are treated as assistance animals in the Fair Housing Act, 
which means that they're lumped into the same category with each other, just like the Air Carrier Act used to. Now, they do also say that an assistance animal is not a pet. Well, this one raises some eyebrows because I've never met an ESA that wasn't a pet. Every ESA is a pet, in my experience. That may not be true in some contexts, but I think when, from an, an interpretation standpoint, it makes more sense to think of this as an assistance animal is not just a pet. It, it could technically be a pet, but if that pet provides the emotional support that alleviates one or more identifiable aspects of a person's disability, then it might still be an assistance animal. So it's kind of all in your interpretation of the verbiage. It's kind of weird. Individuals with a disability can request to keep an assistance animal as a reasonable accommodation to a housing provider's pet restrictions. So if I wanna move into an apartment and that apartment has a no pets allowed policy or no animals allowed policy, then I can still request to have my ESA in the apartment with me as a reasonable accommodation. Now, how do I make that request and what's required for it to work? Housing providers cannot refuse reasonable accommodations in their policies. So I can't say, well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make it so that, you know, I own this property. I'm gonna make it part of the contract that by agreeing to lease here, you're hereby surrendering any right to have an emotional support animal or an assistance animal. There we go, I should be okay then because they signed a legal document, right? But actually the law prohibits you from doing that. You cannot um, make a policy or a contract that says, that removes somebody's right to have an ESA under the right conditions. Can't do that. So, there's key phrases though, like the point is this accommodation has to be necessary for the person with a disability to have the equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling. Well, that sounds good. You're making a requirement, but it sounds awfully nebulous, doesn't it? How do we know whether a person needs an animal in order to have equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling? How do we prove that or disprove that? That's kind of tough. That's where you're going to come in. That's part of your role as a mental health professional. Now, a reasonable accommodation request for an assistance animal may include a request to live with an assistance animal at a property where a housing provider has a no pets policy. And you can also request to waive any pet deposits, fees, or things like that. Now, so are both ESAs and service animals considered assistance animals? In the housing context, yes. When you look at the definition of an assistance animal, it covers both service animals and ESAs. So they are both merged into one category called assistance animal for purposes of housing anyway. Okay, so now by the way, there's you can always click on the links, like I said before, and read the sources of information. This one comes from the U.S. Department of uh, Housing and Urban Development, which of course is the major organization that focuses on um, uh, housing. Now, what does the process look like? Well, the housing provider has to allow this reasonable accommodation if the following conditions are met. Number one, the person requested it. <laughs> So if the person with a disability doesn't request it, then the housing um, authority doesn't have to allow it. You have to request it. So that's the first thing. Second thing, the request has to be supported by reliable disability-related information. If the disability and the disability-related need for the animal were not apparent and the housing provider requests such information. So... As a housing provider, I can just take them on their word. If I was a landlord, I could say, um, I guess landlord's probably not a very good term to use anymore. I don't know. But if I were a housing owner, um, I'll just use landlord because we all know what it means. If I were a landlord, I could say, um, oh, you want, you want to have your ESA in there? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Um, no problem. I don't have to require anything if I don't want to. 
But I can say um, that I'm going to need some additional information from you. Now, that's only if it's not obvious. If my tenant um, walks around with a white cane and wears sunglasses and their eyes are usually ahead of them no matter what's going on, and there's a dog on a leash and that dog has a vest and that dog is clearly guiding the person with the white cane, then I probably shouldn't be asking for anything more. Because the law does say, if the disability and the disability really need were not apparent. Now that's a fuzzy term, what's apparent, what's not apparent, but the description I just provided seems kind of apparent, right? Now, could somebody be a charlatan and could they uh, pose as somebody with a disability and put on a really neat acting show? I guess they could, but um, if you if it looks pretty obvious to you, then you shouldn't, and you're a property owner, you should not be requesting anything additional in my interpretation of the law. So the housing provider is not, um, so these are the things, let's see your granting request. Okay, you also, um, if the person with a disability is requesting the assistance animal, then the, the property owner can turn them down if granting the request would impose an undue financial and administrative burden on, burden on the housing provider. Well, how do you prove that? I mean, if the emotional support animal is a dolphin and the person saying, I need you to build a saltwater aquarium um, on the property to accommodate this animal, that's pretty easy to say that that creates an undue financial administrative burden. I'm sure that scenario doesn't exist. Um, I don't even know if it's legal for a person to own a dolphin. But anyway, um, but when it's like a dog, it's kind of hard to, I mean, how would you know that it would create an undue financial administrative burden? Um, now, my understanding from hearing lawyers speak on this matter is that they say, well, you basically have to be able to show that it'll put you out of business if you do this. That's basically what it would take to turn it down. Not it'll cost me money and take time because everything costs money and takes time, but it uh, you'd have to be able to show it would put you out of business essentially. Also, the housing provider um, could turn it down if the request would fundamentally alter the essential nature of the housing provider's operations. I guess having a saltwater aquarium in the backyard could be an example of that, uh, maybe, or, or in an apartment complex or something. The specific assistance animal in question would pose a direct threat to the health or safety of others. So maybe my emotional support tiger could create, an argument could be made would pose a threat to the health or safety of others, possibly. And the request would not result in significant physical damage to the property of others. So if the um, landlord says this animal is causing damage to other people's property and they can demonstrate that, then they could probably turn the person down. Now, how do you know whether the person has a legitimate request or not if you are a property owner? Well, this is guidance offered by HUD, but it's technically not like this is the mandatory process that you have to follow, but it's guidance that they give, and it's probably what ought to be adhered to. First, you got to determine if the animal is a service animal by asking, is it a dog? Now, if the animal is a dog, um, well, if the animal's not a dog, it's automatically not a service animal. It could still, though, be an assistance animal, like we said before. But only in, even in the Fair Housing Act, only dogs um, can be considered to be service animals. So remember, you've got assistance animal, and then there are two kinds of assistance animals that the law protects. Service animals and emotional support animals. They're both lumped into that same category, but they can be treated a little bit differently when it comes to the part where you're trying to get documentation to back up what the person is requesting. If the animal is a dog, 
then you have to determine if it's readily apparent that the dog is providing a disability-related service. Like I said earlier, I gave you the scenario, individual, white cane, wears sunglasses, appears to be being guided by a professional animal. That's probably readily apparent and probably you should just at that point just, just um, allow the ESA. But you can ask, is the animal required because of a disability? You can't ask what the disability is, but you can ask if the animal is required because of a disability. And then second, you can ask what work or task the animal has been trained to perform. Now, if the tenant says they're not trained to perform any act, then I know they're not a service animal, but they could still be an, an assistance animal because they could be an emotional support animal. So probably none of this really looks surprising. It kind of fits everything that we've set up to this point, right? The law does not require the individual to submit a written request, and it doesn't require them to use terms like reasonable accommodation or assistance animal or any other special words. I mean, the person could literally scrawl, you know, want dog on a napkin and, and then verbally talk to, to, to their landlord, and that's still a request. Or it could be a purely verbal request doesn't have to be a special form or anything like that. However, the individual with a disability is encouraged to do these things because it reduces the likelihood of a misunderstanding. So later on, it's harder, if I were the tenant with the disability, it's harder for me to say that I requested accommodation for my assistance animal if I've got documentation that very clearly lays out what this request is and what and um, what it's about, if I don't have that, it's kind of a, you know, he said, she said sort of scenario um, if it gets challenged. It is also recommended that persons with disabilities keep a copy of their requests and their supporting documentation in case there's a dispute. It's also recommended that housing providers have a consistently maintained list of reasonable accommodation requests. So if your tenant approaches you with a request, you should have a running documentation of any such requests in case this is ever brought to dispute. A resident may request an accommodation for an assistance animal before or after obtaining the animal. So this is interesting. I could move in to my apartment and then after I've moved in, go get the Doberman pincher and then and then after the Doberman Pinscher is already there in the apartment, then I can initiate the request. But it's not advisable to do it that way because such timing may create an inference against good faith on the part of the person. So if, this, if I got turned down under that situation and it got challenged in court, then opposing counsel could say that I wasn't acting in good faith and one piece of evidence of that was, I didn't mention anything about an assistance animal, I signed a tenant or, or a lease that says that I agree that I won't have animals on the property, et cetera. And then I went out and bought a dog. And then only after a neighbor complained that I initiate the request, it makes it easier for opposing counsel to build a case against you if you get the animal first and then initiate the request and make after you know, you've moved in. It'd be better to initiate the request um, you know, before you get the animal if possible. A housing provider is not required to grant a reasonable accommodation that's not been requested. That's obvious. If you didn't know that they wanted it because they didn't initiate a request, then you can't grant it, right? But what are the questions that you can ask to determine whether that accommodation request is reasonable if you're the property owner or the landlord? You can say, does the person, you can ask yourself if the person has an apparent observable disability. We already kind of covered that or they've already given you information that would give you good reason to believe that they have a disability. If those conditions are not met, then you can ask yourself, has the person requesting the accommodation provided me with information that reasonably supports that they are seeking an accommodation because of a disability, that they have a disability? If the requester, the tenant, has not provided 
information that reasonably supports that they're seeking the accommodation because of a disability, but they have a disability in other words, then the housing provider isn't required to grant the accommodation. But they do have to give the tenant a reasonable amount of time to demonstrate that this is disability related. Here are examples of how the tenant could do that. They could provide a document from a federal, state, or local government agency that, that shows that they've been determined to have a disability. They could show the receipt, um, the proof that they have disability benefits or services. They could show that they have um, certain benefits that have been that are awarded only to people with disabilities. They can show eligibility for housing assistance or housing voucher because of a disability. Or, and this is where you all come into play, they could provide information confirming their disability from a healthcare professional, like all of you who are on the webinar today. So when you get a housing request, it's probably, it's really this bullet point, but not just this bullet point, because we have more coming in the next slide here. The request, if the requesters provided adequate information documenting disability, then the next question is, does the person requesting the accommodation, have they given me information that reasonably supports that this animal provides therapeutic emotional support? So you can give me proof that you have a disability. I don't necessarily know what that disability is, but that doesn't mean that this animal is needed for, your, for emotional support. So there's a whole separate set of guidelines on how do you show that the animal is there for therapeutic emotional support. So if they're not a service animal, and instead they're an emotional support animal, but still an assistance animal, then how do you show that to the landlord? Well, that brings us to the next slide. Some examples of ways that this could be demonstrated would be that reasonably supporting would be something like a letter from one of you. So if you had a client and you wrote a letter and that letter, is, letter clearly um, demonstrated that because of a disability, this animal provides um, emotional support or therapeutic assistance of some kind. Um, that is directly connected to the person being able to access and enjoy their, their, their dwelling, then that letter would become a critical part of the process. That letter has to show a relationship or connection between the disability and the need for assistance, the assistance animal. That's especially true in cases of a lot of mental health disorders where the disability is not obvious and visible to the landlord. Housing providers are not allowed to require a healthcare professional to use a specific form. They can request, they can say, would you be willing to complete this form, but they can't require it. They also can't require that the healthcare professional provide a notarized statement and they can't require the professional to make statements under penalty of perjury. They also can't require the professional to provide the individual's specific diagnosis or other detailed information about their specific physical or mental impairments. That doesn't mean that you couldn't provide that kind of information if the client consented to it and it seemed appropriate and um, those sorts of things, but the housing provider can't require those kinds of details. So instead, what should be on this letter? Well, the patient's name should be on it. Whether the healthcare professional has a professional relationship with that patient should be on it. And whether that relationship involves providing healthcare or disability related services, that should be documented in it. The type of animal should also be documented. This is important because if you wrote a generic ESA letter, because uh, because you, in your judgment, the client's chihuahua was needed for emotional support. But then the client goes out and buys a python and then tries to pass the python off as being what the letter is written about. There's no way for the landlord to know 
that that was the case, unless you identified the animal in the letter. So the type of animal can be on there and whether the patient has a physical or mental impairment. You don't have to say what kind of impairment, just that they do have one. And whether that person's impairment substantially limits at least one major life activity or major bodily function, that could be in the letter as well. Now, this is just what should be in the letter. If this were brought to court, you need a lot more than this. So there's what's in your file and there's what's in the letter that goes to the property owner. We'll get to that when we look at the court case in a little bit here. Whether the patient needs the animal um, or in the case of emotional support animal, because it provides therapeutic emotional support to alleviate a symptom or effect of the disability. It is not merely a pet. So the letter should, if it's an ESA, the letter should say, this animal provides therapeutic emotional support to alleviate a symptom or effect of the, of the uh, individual's disability and is not merely a pet. It should say that. Now, a bonus point, if you can document that without the animal, the symptoms or effects of the person's disability will be significantly increased. So if you can somehow document, if this person can't have this animal, then their disability is gonna be worse or their symptoms are gonna be exacerbated. And then you should also sign and date the letter with any contact information and your professional licensing information. So they could look you up and determine whether you really do have a healthcare license if they wanted to. Now, before we go any further and we look at some legal definitions here involving all this, because I know there's a lot of information, I'm just gonna go back to the chat box. I see a couple posts. I had a client fill out an ROI for me to give a letter to an apartment complex. Yes, that is exactly what you would want to do if you were gonna be um, creating an ESA letter, an ROI should be filled out, absolutely. And uh, Howie added, and that the disability has a diagnostic code. Well, it doesn't say that you have to put a diagnostic code anywhere in the info from HUD, but you could do that if you wanted to. Um, in your file, you better have it because if it goes to court, um, you need way more information to have a good case than what's in that letter that goes to the housing person. Gail says, we had an issue with an attendee bringing her very small ESA to a workshop. Another attendee became enraged, stating she was terrified of dogs. After that, our attorney created a statement about only service dogs being allowed with documentation. And we then offer to those with an ESA the event online, or we'll host a special workshop for that person. Okay, everything in that sounds good to me, except for I don't think that you can require documentation for a service animal. Um, I, be, I, I think that's that would actually be like an ADA violation potentially if you required documentation. Um, because if we go back to the ADA law, it says we, we, you know, that a public accommodation can't require documentation that the animal is a service animal. But it can say we only allow service animals, and then you can ask certain questions to try and observe behaviors to gauge in your judgment whether it's a service animal or not. So then uh, let's see here. Okay, let's move on to some definitions though, because there are, there are a lot of terms we just threw around in the last few slides, right? What's a physical or mental impairment even? What does that even mean? It can include any physiological disorder or condition, cosmetic disfigurement or anatomical loss affecting one or more of the following body systems. Or, and this one's probably what's gonna apply to, for most of you, any mental or psychological disorder, such as intellectual disability, organic brain syndrome, emotional or mental illness, and specific learning disability, or various diseases or conditions, including mental retardation, emotional illness, drug addiction. Um, so that one's kind of interesting. Drug addiction other than, oops, drug addiction can be a qualifying um, condition for the housing law. I don't know why somebody needs to have an ESA because of a drug addiction, but 
it's easier for me to understand because of depression or anxiety or whatever else, but maybe it exists. Maybe there is such a need out there. But it doesn't count if the person is currently using an illegal or controlled substance. So I can't, I can't be sitting in my apartment snorting cocaine and saying, yeah, I need that ESA because of my cocaine addiction. So I'm automatically disqualified if I'm still using drugs. Now, how would your, your landlord know all of that about you is another question. But what are the major life activities or major bodily functions that you're essentially trying to say that the animal's needed for? For mental health conditions, it's probably about caring for oneself, learning, speaking, and working. Now, I'm going to show you two good cases of an ESA letter later on where it's pretty clear a good case was made that this animal is needed because of a mental health condition for the individual to care for themselves, learn, speak, or work. But I'm also going to show you some bad cases in a moment here. What are some examples of work, tasks, assistance, and emotional support pertaining to mental health? Well, it could be helping somebody by preventing or interrupting impulsive or destructive behaviors. So like a dog, a client has trichotillomania and a dog is trained to intervene in some way if you are um, pulling on your hair to draw your attention or awareness to it. That could be an example. That would actually be a service animal, I would argue, because they're specifically trained. Reminding a person with mental illness to take prescribed medication. You could also argue that as a service animal. Taking an action to calm a person with PTSD during an anxiety attack, also probably a service animal. Assisting the person in dealing with disability-related stress or pain. Well, that could be an ESA or service animal. Assisting a person with mental illness to leave the isolation of home or to interact with others. Emotional support animals can do that. Enabling a person to deal with the symptoms or effects of major depression by providing a reason to live. So in other words, the only reason I get out of bed every morning is because my dog needs to be taken care of. That could be a case where you could argue that an ESA was necessary. Providing emotional support that alleviates at least one identified symptom or effect of a physical or mental impairment. So you can see how some of these look more like service animals, and then some of them are things that an ESA could do instead. Now, um, most of you are not in Florida, so I'm not going to bother going over Florida law. Um, some of you are probably in Florida, but each state has its own law, um, its, own, its own laws governing ESAs. The thing is, a state cannot require, uh, can't trump federal law. So in other words, if federal law says that a public accommodation cannot request documentation of the person's disability when they're trying to use bring a service animal in, then no state can say, um, you must provide written documentation when, when you want accommodation, a public accommodation. A state law can't, re, can't impinge on the rights that federal law is given to that person with a disability. So keep that in mind. A state law could give more rights to the person like state law, a state law could be passed that says um, all, you know, public services must accommodate emotional support animals. They could do that if they wanted to. Um, but they can't say something like um, no business in the state of Florida is required to allow a service animal on the premises because that violates a right afforded by the federal government to individuals with disabilities. Now, how does this start to play into some of our ethical codes? Well, our ethical codes require us to be advocates for our clients. This is one of the arguments people use in, in favor of ESAs and of writing letters for ESAs. They say, look, my client has a disability. This ESA alleviates their symptoms. Um, we should advocate for them and write these letters. Now, remember, if you're a forensic evaluator in your interaction with a person, you're not there to advocate for them. Um, I know that might seem weird because you're reading this screen right here, but remember, the ethical codes have a different section for forensic evaluations. And that section says, you're not there to advocate for somebody. You're there to simply answer questions posed by legal entities in an objective manner as possible 
Um, but uh, you're not there to advocate if you're a forensic evaluator. But if you're the clinician, and you're in a therapeutic relationship with the client, then you could argue, uh, I ought to advocate for them and I ought to write this letter if it seems appropriate for this letter to be written. I know that's an if. The same is true for the other codes of ethics, CRCC for rehabilitation counselors, social workers, the NASW code of ethics. But this does bring us to a polling question. The polling question is, and just a reminder, if you haven't yet been set up for the polling questions, here are the instructions at the top so that you could enter in. This is a free form question. You can type whatever you want into it in as your response. But the question is, what do you think are some of the challenges and controversies about ESAs? What do you think has made this subject so controversial and so challenging, especially for us as mental health professionals? Why has it been such a tough issue to address? Now you can type a sentence, a paragraph, a phrase, a word, whatever you like, and just send it off. What do you think are some challenges and controversies about emotional support animals? Some of you have already hinted at a couple in the chat box earlier. So lack of uniformity in the field, yes, because people, it, it's not like, you know, every mental health professional is following some particular set of best practices with addressing these letters. I would argue that we should, but malingering, people who are feigning their disorder or disability to get that pet. A client who has more than one dog. Yes, someone being well aware they have a pet but they're trying to make other people believe it's an ESA. People taking advantage, a lack of consistency with verbiage and expectations. People wanting to avoid pet fees. I don't really need this animal. I want this animal and I don't want to pay a pet fee. So I try to exaggerate things. Some people abuse the privilege when they're really just pets. Landlords and owners being too restrictive sometimes. It becomes a privilege option for the low-income and communities of color to be more scrutinized. Yeah, that's a good argument. I think, honestly, people worry less about legal action being taken against them when the person in front of them is low of low income, for example. They're like, what's this person going to do? Hire an attorney to go after me? They don't have the money for that. So I think that's a good point. They want a certain restricted breed to be accepted. Yes, that can be an issue. You know, you, have, you might have a place that says, we don't allow Rottweilers. Um, but the law doesn't say, you know, that you can, you can turn down a request for an assistance animal because it's a Rottweiler. It doesn't allow an exception for the breed of dog. So that's a good point as well. Also in the chat box, some people are chiming in. Um, there are only so much, uh, there are only so much as mental health professionals we can assess as true. We can't go to their home, spend substantial time with their animals, talk extensively with those that know the participant. That's a good point. Poorly behaved animals in the airport. I have experienced difficulties with clients that have pit bulls. Most refuse to allow them in my area. And then Christine says, oh, I have a Rottweiler. <laughs> They're big babies. Yeah, I, I love Rottweilers myself. I've never met a Rottweiler that I don't like, but you know, uh, People have beliefs about breeds. Maybe some of them are substantiated. I don't know, but I, I think most uh, most well treated dogs um, behave well, just like most well treated human beings behave well. But all right, so we get a sense though of what some of your thoughts are about this. Pamela, you have raised your hand. I don't know if you did it on purpose or an accident, but just in case. I'm going to allow you to talk so you can unmute yourself right now if you want, um, in case you intentionally raised your hand. And I do not hear you. So I will just assume it was an accidental hand raising and lower it. 
Oops. Um, yeah, there we go. Let me just fix something real quick. There we go. Okay. So let's see here. What else do we have in the chat box? Um, I think that was it in the chat box. All right. So let's get back then to the, uh, oh, I think I might've missed one of these comments too. People taking advantage, clients who have more than one dog, misrepresented their pets in the past and mistrust is a significant problem. Okay, I think we covered them all. Hmm, Let's see if I can get this fixed. All right, plan B. Let me try to hit escape and get out of this. Real quick. There we go. Okay. So let's go into some of these controversies. The first one is it's hard sometimes to differentiate. Is this a service animal or is it an ESA or is it a pet? Sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference. It is illegal in many states. There are state laws that um, are designed to target people fraudulently portraying service animals or their pets as service animals. Many states have laws, but I don't think they're often enforced um, at the same time. So there's no shortage of media coverage about this stuff. stuff. Several states crack down on fake service animals. Service animal scams, a growing problem. Laws aim to stop owners from listing pets as working dogs. Because you can go online and buy a service dog vest for any animal you want to and then hope that people think it's a service animal. Numerous states cracking down on fake service dogs. Delta Airlines tightens rules for service and support animals. You can tell this is outdated because this was before the 2021 law change. Why pigs have started to fly, the emotional support scam. This gives you a clue as to why it was that we lost ESAs being protected on air travel under federal law. United Titans rules for ESAs, fake service animals while airline passengers are upset. The emotional support animals on planes signal a cult of victimhood. So the second one is that untrained, poorly trained, and poorly behaved emotional support animals have been also a challenge and a controversy. Sometimes people will bring an ESA onto a plane into public facilities that are poorly trained or dangerous. No shortage of those cases. Emotional support dog bites girl on Southwest Airlines flight, for example. And then one client's gain is another client's loss. So if one client says, you know, I need my emotional support animal with me when I go into your therapy practice, but they bring their dog in and another client has a phobia of dogs or another client has an allergy to dogs or another client um, is very sensitive to odors and the dog has an odor. Um, so there are, or the dog's loud and kind of unruly and, um, or jumps on people and things like that, then obviously this, you know, what, what could be a gain for one person could be problematic for a large number of people who have their own disorders sometimes. Strange, exotic, and disruptive ESAs. People sometimes try to pass off snakes, spiders, lizards, turkeys, and other unusual animals as ESAs. And so this, we are going to watch just for fun. Um. <laughs> All right, so that was just for fun, but these are some real cases. This is a Florida peacock brought in as an emotional support animal case. It's because of these kinds of things that the laws were revised so that in 2021, there wouldn't be, um, emotional support animals would not be protected in the way that service animals were protected in the context of air travel. Here's our duck with its really cool service animal looking web, uh, webbed foot covering, um, the emotional support turkeys, the emotional support tarantulas, 
the emotional support snakes. This website literally, one thing I really hate about this website is they talk about, oh yeah, get a letter for your emotional support snake so you can bring it on a plane. Except the problem is that even in the old regs, snakes could be banned from being on the plane, even if they're an ESA. So that made this all the more egregious in my opinion. Um, I guess, oh, this is a good video to help really understand what happened with air travel, I think, from the perspective of individuals with disabilities who have service animals. So one thing I noticed, I wrote an, an article um, in the in 2018 for the for the American Mouth Counselors Association's Advocate magazine on ESA letters. And since then, I would get calls from disability rights organizations asking for some technical expertise in their quest to get ESAs out of the Air Carrier Access Act. So in other words, it was disability rights groups that primarily helped to get that law changed um, so that ESAs are no longer protected the same way that service animals are protected on the airlines. Because what was happening as, the, as people continued to abuse the, the privilege of ESAs on planes and it got more and more out of hand and the requests kept increasing every year and it was, it was getting kind of ridiculous, more clamping down was happening that made it harder for people with legitimate service animals who also were upset that other people were abusing the system who don't have disabilities or who maybe they do have a disability, but they don't need that animal on the plane. They're just trying to save the price of a ticket or something along those lines. So it became quite an issue. And of course, you know, there's no shortage of articles being published in our field. Um, some, an important point that I wanna make, I think David, uh, Dr. David Lay made the a point well, in uh, Psychology Today in a blog that he wrote, a blog posting. Therapists who write these letters rarely understand the nuances and complexities of these laws or requirements. They don't understand that drafting the letter actually serves a legal purpose, but they are attesting to the person having a legal disability. And they're asserting that the animal's required as an accommodation for this disability. Defending this determination in court could be a challenge. If the therapist is called upon to explain their decision, and the ways they reached this opinion. So we'll come back to that and what would happen in a court case because we do have a real court case to look at in a little bit here. Now, therapists are sometimes writing these letters but they do not know what the law says about the letter they're writing. That's a big problem. If you don't know what the law says but you're writing a letter, then you could either be writing a letter that prevents a client with a legitimate need of an emotional support animal from getting what they need, which could in, in cause them undue harm, or you could be writing something that's kind of fraudulent without realizing it, or you could be writing something that is attesting to things that you could never defend in court and could get you into some difficulty with malpractice um, lawsuits. So it's actually kind of a big deal. I know some therapists, they don't treat these letters as a big deal, but they really are. You're attesting to some very serious things that you have to have adequate information to attest to. If you look at our ethical codes, we base our opinions on multiple data sources. When, when we're providing opinions that have legal bearing for people. So when a client comes in and, and they just say, or they call a place up, pay a fee, and then get a letter over the phone, that's really not due diligence, is it? So veracity and integrity are two really important ethical precepts here. If you don't understand the world of disability, you probably shouldn't be writing these letters, right? Because disability isn't just disorder. Yeah, disorder can be a disability, but disability is a broader construct. 
it's got different, there are different ways to define disability, but here's one. Um, someone has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. So let's pause right there for a moment. Imagine that you wrote an ESA letter for a client, and then maybe that client's landlord turns them down, it ends up in court, you're testifying, and you're asked which major life activities um, are substantially limited by this person's disability. If your answer is, uh, uh, then you're not doing so well, right? You should know exactly what major life activities um, are being negatively affected by the person's symptoms. What can they not do or have limited ability to do? And then you should be able to draw a connection between those activities and the animal. So I can tell you all day long, yeah, my client has a hard time concentrating and focusing. Well, how does this emotional support animal alleviate that? And can you give us an example? Uh, well, they find it easier to concentrate if the animal's around. Can you give us an example? No, I can't. So you see how in the legal realm, the burden of proof is very different. And the level of detail you have to provide or that you may have to provide is very different than the level of detail that you put in the letter that you write, which is more bare bones. So you'd have to know that you have all this stuff in your file and you can demonstrate that all these things are true. You can say, here are the impairments imposed by my client's disorder. Here are the major life activities that are limited. And then you should be able to explain how this animal helps to alleviate those. Here are some other definitions of disability, but in the Fair Housing Act, again, we see a physical, or it should say mental, there's a typo there, I need to insert that word. A physical or mental impairment which substantially limits one or more of such person's life activities. So again, if you can't attest to which life activities are limited substantially by the person's impairments, then you're already, um, you're already on pretty thin ice. If you read the professional literature, and there are, there are several journal articles published in um, peer-reviewed professional journals that deal with emotional support animals, and specifically the mental health professional's role in writing these letters, disability determination is pretty complex. It's not simple. And it usually requires reviewing evidence, not just what the client tells you. That could be um, identifying their relevant signs and symptoms, um, it could be psychological testing or laboratory results being reviewed. And then all the data you collect has to be able to show that there's a medically determinable mental impairment, that it exists. This is an example. This is the state of Florida, um, like a checklist of mental and emotional and interpersonal um, impairments that are posed by disorders. Let's uh, Here's an example, limited ability to concentrate or focus on work activities or tasks. Limited ability or unable to work in varied climatic conditions. Difficulty telling time or making change or performing mathematical calculations. These are all impediments or limitations that are created by somebody's disorder. Which limitations does your client have? Could you answer that under oath? And could you show that this animal helps to alleviate or somehow circumvent that limitation. Can you break it down to that level of detail? If you can't, you probably shouldn't be writing these letters. For the mental health professional working with a patient, disability is not just about what's more comfortable for them. It's about a psychological disorder or problem that interferes with that patient's ability to perform major life activities. And you need to show that that patient needs the presence of the animal to remain psychologically stable, not wants the presence, not would benefit from, but they need this animal in order to circumvent that functional impairment. You see how that burden is much stronger than, oh, it would be nice if they could have an animal with them. So it's not just about a DSM diagnosis. You have to show significant impairment. And that without this animal, the person cannot adequately function in the context of housing, if you're writing a housing letter. 
our codes of ethics tell us that we need to be competent to perform the duties that we're performing, right? So if you're writing ESA letters, but you don't understand disability, you don't understand the law as it pertains to ESAs, you don't understand functional limitations or impediments, um, and you can't draw connections between an animal and those impairments, then are you really competent to do that service that you are providing? The AMCA Code of Ethics says that we value objectivity and, integ uh, and integrity um, as a highest standard in our services. And of course, makes it very clear that we have to be competent to perform the duties that we're performing. And you see the same also um, when we're interpreting and reporting evaluation results, we base our conclusions on multiple sources of data. So if you go to court and they ask, what sources of data did you use to determine that this person has a disability and needs this animal? And you say, well, they told me they do. That's not enough. That's one data point. What the client tells you, a clinical interview is one data point. You need multiple data points, right? You need to have other data points. Now, the question I have for you, and I, and I forgot to make a polling question out of this, but you can answer it in the chat box right now. What are the other data points that you could use besides the client's self-report if you were gonna write an emotional support animal letter? So Christine says, I use the WHODAS, the BDI2, the BAI, and other collateral interviews with family. Well said, Christine. So Christine is using, using different measures. Now there's good news and bad news about the measures she listed. The good news is they're researched measures, they're validated, they might be very appropriate, like the HUDAS, highly appropriate for these kinds of um, assessments. The BDI2 and BAI are great. The only problem with them is they don't do much to be able to screen for could this person be exaggerating or feigning symptoms or malingering. There are other measures that could be used for that though. But that's probably what Christine just listed, I'm sure is more than what most people are doing who are writing these letters. And Carol says, um, a letter from a vet or a letter from friends and families. Okay, that's a good idea. Those are collateral sources. Robin says, the SIRS. So Robin, gold points for you because yes, the SIRS is a structured interview that is designed to detect the probability of malingering or feigning of symptoms. Now, I only use the SIRS if I have reason to use it. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in a moment, because we are going to get to some tests and measures in a few moments here. All right, no other comments so far, it looks like. Oh, uh, Mark says, where can someone find these tools for free? So Mark, uh, the tool, we're going to show you that in just a moment. Direct observation, Mariella says. Uh, good point. Mark says, I had a couple of them, but not the SIRS. So one time I was on a plane from Tampa International Airport to Dallas-Fort Worth, and there was a emotional support animal a dog on the plane with somebody with probably anxiety. And this dog was giving everybody anxiety on the plane. Um, and so if I was thinking to myself, whoever wrote that letter probably didn't get to observe how this animal would function in a context like this and know that there's no way this is helping anxiety for anybody, including the client, because it's making things worse for all of us. This dog was so unruly the entire plane ride. Um, so Mark says, I have a couple of them, but not the SIRS. Okay, great. Well, let me tell you about, we're gonna talk about tests and measures in a moment here. Also the APA's code of ethics talks about the competence for the services that we're providing and that we base our opinions on multiple data sources. So does the American Psychiatric Association. I know we don't have any psychiatrists on today, or we do actually, I think, have a couple psychiatrists on today. But, um, but all essentially all of the association's code of ethics say we have to be competent, we have to know what we're doing when we provide these kinds of services. I would argue that means you gotta know the law, you gotta know how ethics apply, and you gotta know clinical practice uh, and um, we also have to base opinions that we're offering, in this case, 
by extension to legal authorities eventually. We have to be able to offer those opinions based on multiple data sources and not just one. And one of the problems is these people who call a place up, spend a few minutes on the phone, that's only one data source and that's not sufficient from an ethical standpoint, in my opinion. So you'll see lots in the literature about this. Some people argue that therapists shouldn't even be allowed to do these letters. It should be an independent forensic evaluator who does it, but that's not the way the law reads right now. Now, here's another concern. The use of emotional support animals can sometimes interfere with therapeutic process. I'm gonna give two examples of that. I'm gonna argue that sometimes an emotional support animal is not therapeutic for a client. In fact, it's the opposite. Sometimes an emotional support animal will exacerbate the client's mental disorder. Let me give you three real case scenarios. Now, some facts have been altered to better protect the identity of people involved, but these are real cases, at least based on real cases. Here's scenario number one. Ralph was recently kicked out of his home by his wife who's now considering divorce because of his chronic alcoholism and lack of follow through with recovery. Ralph took the family dog with him and moved into an apartment. He shows up for his next therapy session with his dog with him, who's not very well behaved. Ralph discloses that he's continued drinking and has not attended AA meetings because he cannot leave his dog alone. But he does want an ESA letter. So what do you think is problematic about Ralph's request for an ESA letter? when given the information you just saw in that scenario. So Howie says, we also need to meet the animal. So Howie, I, I, um, that's a, that is a great perspective and a lot of people agree with you on it. I do not typically meet the animal myself and I'll tell you why I don't and what my rationale is for it. But many people argue that that ought to be the way that it's done. Carol says he's using the dog as an excuse for treatment in the chat box. But remember, you can also send your response through polling questions. What is the disability? Well, in this case, I would say alcoholism is the disability that he's using, um, or let's say depression even. Um, let's assume he had a depressive disorder. But yeah, you would need to know what the disability is. So that's a great point. Anybody else see a problem with the scenario? What did he say about his AA meeting? He stopped, he went back to drinking, right? He's not attending AA. What was his reason given for not going to AA meetings? It was, I can't leave my dog alone. That one was really interesting to me because I'm like, AA meetings are an hour long and they're AA meetings within a few minutes of, of his apartment. So is he saying he can't leave a dog alone for an hour and a half? Why? What dog is incapable of surviving an hour and a half without the presence of a human? I, 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 so part of how I addressed that with him was I asked him, well, let me ask you something. Before you moved out, where was that dog kept? Well, it was kept in the house. Who would be at home during the daytime? Nobody, because I'm at work and my wife's at work. How long would the two of you be at work? You know, eight to 10 hours. When you came home, was the dog dead? No. Obviously, this dog can survive an hour and a half without you because it used to survive eight to 10 hours without you. So I think it'll be okay. It was a bizarre rationalization. Doesn't really make sense. He's using the ESA's presence as some kind, it's the latest in a series of weird reasons that he gives for not pursuing his recovery when his drinking is out of control and is destroying his life. Now there are others like, uh, even if you wrote a letter, he's still not gonna be able to bring it to AA. Uh, um, at least there's no legal protection because there's no federal law that says that, uh, remember the ADA doesn't cover emotional support animals. So no AA meeting is obligated to accommodate the presence of the emotional support animal. So why would you write a letter for something that you know is not protected by the law anyway. That doesn't make sense. And it's possible the animal might not even be well enough behaved to be an SA because it's not well behaved in your office. So how's it gonna be well behaved in a meeting and not be a distraction to others who are pursuing their recovery? You see 
how the problems can compound and compound and compound here. So more so letter of convenience compared to an actual limitation based on a disability. Yeah, you have to assess, but it might be kind of hard to show that he needs this animal because of a disability and would not do well without it. It might be easy to show that depending on what you find if you assess it further, but you can already see some clear yellow flags at the very least with this scenario. So here's case scenario number two. Juanita shows for initial appointment with a three-tiered baby stroller containing two chihuahuas and a cat, one animal in each compartment. During the appointment, she appears quite distracted, tending to the needs of her restless animals. She reports that she's not certain she'll have much time for therapy because she's very busy with her fur babies. But she would like an ESA letter. So what do you see as being the problems with this scenario? What's problematic about Juanita's request for an ESA letter. Juanita showed up to therapy. She's kind of disheveled. She seems stressed. She's got a three-tiered baby stroller, three animals. She's not paying, not participating well in the session because she's too busy attending to their needs. And she's saying, I don't think I have time for therapy because I'm too busy taking care of these animals. So we've got codependency with the animals. She's more preoccupied with their needs and helping them with their needs. Good point. This is, I believed in her case, another in a series of experiences where she will do all kinds of things to avoid taking care of herself and addressing her own mental health uh, needs and treatment. So she will acquire animals and then develop the false belief that they must be with her at all times um, and that that's somehow therapeutic for her when she seems very stressed and disheveled and overwhelmed, but can't participate in therapy because of her caregiving responsibilities. Now, I was kind of like also sitting there looking at those poor animals wiggling in those compartments thinking, oh my gosh, I, I can't imagine these three animals like finding this very nice to be like strapped into strollers all day long. So I also had a concern in my head about the animals and their well-being, but um, that's a that's another side issue. The animals overshadow her mental health issues. The animals disconnected her from community and from being present and from getting therapy. So these are all good good answers and good points from each of you. So I'm not anti-ESA letter. That'll become clear when I get to the good cases in a little bit. But I do want people to be very much aware of real scenarios where, in my judgment, it wasn't a very therapeutic thing. Here's case scenario number three, and this is the last scenario, like sort of bad case scenario that we'll look at. Emmett contacts a therapist and asks if he can get an emotional support animal. Um, he explains that he and his girlfriend are going to fly up north to visit family. Um, it's actually supposed to be an ESA letter that he's asking for. His girlfriend has a chihuahua that she does not want to leave behind as it makes her anxious. Plus, he explains, dog kennels are expensive and so are fees for bringing them on a plane. The therapist explains that if Emmett's girlfriend would like treatment for anxiety, she can come in and, she, and the therapist can conduct an assessment and treatment plan, which may or may not include an emotional support animal. Emmett responds, oh, she doesn't want treatment. She just wants to bring her dog on the plane. So what do we see as the problems or concerns with this scenario? What could be problematic about Emmett's request for an ESA letter? She doesn't want treatment. It's amazed me that the majority of the ESA letter requests I've received are people who do not want therapy. Um, they're saying, I have a mental health condition and it's so bad, I need to have this animal with me, but I don't want therapy. No, 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 no. Don't want that. So they're avoiding therapy, but saying they're highly distressed and need help. The anxiety does not create a real impairment. Yeah, probably not in her case. We don't know because we haven't done an evaluation with her yet, but um, in this case scenario, the therapist could be supporting malingering. Yes, because assuming that this is a malingering case, the therapist could be supporting it by writing a letter, taking advantage of the system and using animals. So I think you got the gist of the problem here. That would be, that's probably one of those scenarios where it sounds like um, this person just wants to save money and have their dog with them at the same time. Here's a court case in 2009. Han versus Shoreline Towers Phase One Condominium Associates. 
this is what happened in this scenario. A psychologist met with a um, client and provided an evaluation. And in this evaluation, the psychologist wrote, um, or and after a few appointments with the client, the psychologist wrote a letter. In this letter, the psychologist opined that the plaintiff suffered from severe panic attacks, was unable to properly cope with anxiety and stress, and was particularly vulnerable while residing at his home or condo due to past occurrences on that property. Dr. Evans thus wrote that he was prescribing a service animal to provide support and help the plaintiff cope with his emotionally crippling disability. Um, very dramatic verbiage in my opinion, but although the defendants could not have known this at the time, the record shows that at the time Dr. Evans signed this one page letter, his entire treatment of the plaintiff consisted of two recent one hour counseling sessions. During the second session, the plaintiff gave Dr. Evans the text or template for the letter that he wanted to be sent to Shoreline. Dr. Evans testified during deposition that he used much of what the plaintiff wrote, although he probably made some changes to the letter before sending it to the board. So the, what happened in this case was the court de de made a de determination in favor of the landlord. The court basically said, uh, two one-hour appointments with somebody where you just talk to them and then they give you this template and you maybe edit it a bit. That's not enough. That's just not enough. Well, if that's not enough, then a 15 minute phone call with someone you've never met in person is not enough, which means a lot of these internet scams are not enough. This psychologist at least met with the person for two appointments for, for two one hour appointments in person, nonetheless, that's more than what a lot of these services are doing and have been doing. That's a lot more than what a lot of these services are doing. And I also, I'm not here to demonize people who have written these letters in the past um, with good intentions in our field. I know lots of therapists, they, you know, they kind of don't know what they don't know sometimes, right? So you're working with this client and the client comes in and says, there's only one apartment complex I can afford to move into. Now I'm going to, I'm going to build this up for you a little bit here in Pinellas County, where I live, property values have been skyrocketing insanely, skyrocketing insanely. Right. When I was in grad school in 2000, like a four ish or five, I want to say it was maybe um, probably about 2005. I moved into a studio apartment in St. Petersburg and it was a, it was just a very small studio apartment and, you know, kind of like a, it certainly wasn't in a horrible neighborhood, not the best neighborhood, but it was $350 a month, that one room studio apartment, $350 a month. And then last year I looked up that same studio apartment and last year it was $650 a month. So that's twice the value that it was however many years ago when I was in uh, my master's program. Now, that wasn't too surprising, although a little bit surprising to see that prices have doubled in that number of years. But this year, one year later, it's $1,350 a month for the same apartment. Now, they did renovate it a little, but it's still just a one-room studio apartment in the same neighborhood, in the same complex. And that kind of stuff is happening everywhere. So it's getting harder and harder to afford, afford rent. So what if you're lower income and you have a mental disorder and you're seeing a therapist and you're like, there's only one apartment I can afford to move into anywhere near my job. And that apartment doesn't allow animals or it requires a $500 deposit that I don't have or whatever. And I have a pet dog. And this dog I love, and this dog is like a child to me, and I couldn't imagine losing this dog. It would make sense to me that, it, and, and this, this person said, and by the way, my landlord did say, or, or the new property owner did say, well, there is an exception, and that's if you have an emotional support animal letter. So could you write me that letter? They said it's just a letter that shows that the animal helps me with my depression and my anxiety. I can see how well-intentioned therapists would fall into a trap and write that letter with very little work on their part. 
But what they don't realize is they're writing a letter that's saying this person has a disability, that I can identify the functional impairments that they have, and that I know that they need this animal in order to alleviate those functional impairments. And in good practice, they've used multiple data points and not just the client's self-report. They're not thinking that when they're writing this letter, right? So I can see how well-intentioned therapists trying to be helpful to their clients have fallen into this trap. But when you know what you know, you can't unknow it. And you know it from this webinar. So if that were your client, you'd have to say, well, we'll have to do some assessments and we'll have to look into it. Here's the process. And I'm going to need to um, maybe do some collateral interviews with family members. I might need to pull some other records. I might need to do some testing with you. Or I might need to refer you to a colleague who is, who is competent to write those letters and understands how they work. And, and then you can sign a release form that lets me provide referral information to that person. So they kind of know why it is that you're coming. And that would be the better way to approach that scenario. So that if this is a legitimate case, then by the time that letter is written, you know it's ironclad. You know that the client's going to get what they really need to get, or that it's likely that they will. But also, you never know. That client that you've been working with might just be engaging in some malingering or something. So have you done your due diligence? That is the question. This is a good case scenario. This was a uh, case where because of a mental illness, um, a uh, letter was written on the behalf of a veteran suffering from PTSD. And in this letter, the mental health professional was pretty specific and clear and direct. Due to mental illness, um, Bogata has certain limitations regarding social interaction and coping with stress and anxiety. In order to help alleviate these difficulties and to enhance his ability to live independently and to fully use and enjoy the dwelling unit, I am prescribing an emotional support animal that will assist um, Bo Bogata in coping with his disability. I am prescribing an emotional support animal that will assist Bogata in coping with his disability, specifically his dog, Kane. As there, he has a therapeutic relationship with a specific dog, Kane. As an emotional support animal, Kane serves to ameliorate otherwise difficult to manage day-to-day -day psychiatric symptoms. And uh, Bogata has certain limitations regarding social interaction and coping with stress and anxiety. This limits his ability to work directly with other people, a major life activity. He's able to work with the assistance of his emotional support animal. Otherwise, his social interactions would be so overwhelming that he'd be unable to perform work of any kind. You see how, how this is really covering the bases. We're showing there's a disorder. We're saying there are functional limitations. We're saying this specific animal ameliorates those specific limitations and that without this animal, this person's not gonna be able to function and fully um, enjoy their, their dwelling or occupy their dwelling. So um, I'm gonna give you two other true case scenarios that I worked with though later on. But before we get to that, we got a couple polling questions. This, this question is, these are beliefs that you have as a provider. Do you believe that people are entitled to a life free of emotional and psychological stress? You can say A for yes, B for no, or C for not sure. Do you believe that people are entitled to a life free of emotional and psychological stress? All right. Well, they're also in the chat box. We have one person said A. Gail asked the question entitled. And I think you're zeroing in on an important word, Gail. I would argue, I'm going to disagree with the majority of you. And this is kind of unique because usually when I do this presentation, the majority isn't saying yes. So you guys are in a unique group. But I'm going to respectfully disagree with the majority here. Number one, I don't think people are entitled to a life without stress. Number two, I don't think it's healthy to have a life without stress. I think that's a terrible idea. 
I think that would be highly damaging and be the end of all civilization if we had no stress in our lives. Okay, so this is a fun. This is a, a this is a philosophical belief, right? And for me, I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist, and I'm heavily influenced by the philosophy of Stoicism, which is not an anti-emotion philosophy at all. Even though the word Stoic means something to people different than the philosophy does, but we have to have stress. Stress evolved for a reason in the human brain. It is necessary for our survival. It motivates us to do important things and to, and to engage in a value congruent life. Without stress, we wouldn't know what's dangerous and what's not dangerous, what's problematic and not problematic. And we wouldn't be as motivated to take righteous action to do the right thing. We have to have stress in our lives. And not only do we have, and it's impossible to live a stress-free life. That's not even possible, first of all. And if it was possible, it'd be the end of civilization, I think. And um, even if it were possible, we're not entitled to it because the fact is that life involves stress. Now, I know you might be saying, well, I kind of took that question more to mean, you know, is, is stress bad? Well, stress is sometimes bad. Sometimes it's good. If you know the difference between eustress and distress, eustress is stress about good things. It's stressful for me to have to get onto this webinar and present with a bunch of people I can't see. Does that mean it's a bad thing or I should avoid it? No. Um, it was stressful to create the PowerPoints to put together for the presentation. But I think it was a really valuable and value congruent thing to do. And I'm glad we're doing it. A lot of things are stressful. It's stressful for me to drive to work sometimes, but it's well worth the drive. It's okay to have, it's a good thing for me to have a little bit of stress on the road because I live in the most densely populated county in the state and we have some pretty dense thick traffic here and you do have to be kind of vigilant. Yes, there's gonna be some stress. That's probably a good thing. If I was too relaxed and too de-stressed, under those conditions, I might not do as good of a job. I not, might not perform as well. We know in research, for example, college students who have a little bit of stress about the exam do better than college students who have no stress about it and do better than college students who have too much stress about it. We need stress in our lives. And it's not always a bad thing. It can be a good thing sometimes. But most of the time we're working with people that their relationship with stress is pretty bad, right? And they probably have too much stress in their life. And they often lack the resources, either internally or externally, to adequately cope with that stress. So we work with kind of the extreme in the scenario of stress, but we're not entitled to a life free of emotional and psychological stress. It's okay to disagree with me on that, but I think it's fundamental to check in with your own beliefs. And there's a reason I'm asking you this question that we'll get to in a moment here. Now, hopefully I haven't too much um, given away the farm here, because the next question is, do you think that a stress and worry free life is a good therapeutic goal? Well, maybe now I've, I've tainted your answer to this question. I should have waited until after this one to say what I thought about it. Um, but so far, um, everyone who's responded has said, yes, I do think it's a good and therapeutic goal. So continue to respond the way that you believe for me, I don't think it's a good goal. I think a good goal, and this is the way I write it on my treatment plans, is we'll experience a reduction in stress and an improved ability to cope with stress. Because I know we A, cannot eliminate stress from anybody's lives fully. B, it would be unhealthy to do so because stress often guides us in positive and adaptive ways. So I don't want to write a treatment goal on a treatment plan that says, you know, We'll, we'll have a stress and worry-free life or something like that. That would be a terrible idea. I instead do, we'll experience a reduction in stress. And if it's like an adjustment disorder, a stress associated with whatever those acute stressors are and an improved ability to cope with stress. So we're kind of divided on, on this one. That's okay. And I might have one more about this. Let me see if that's true or not. No, I don't. So here's why I asked those questions. Because I think these ads are almost like predatorial I, that you see on the internet. 
You're entitled to a life free of emotional and psychological stress. I believe that's a dysfunctional core belief and we don't want to feed it. And by the way, if you just get an ESA letter, you'll be on your way to living stress and worry free. I believe that is impossible and therefore it is false advertising. And again, it would be maladaptive to live a life that is stress and worry free. We need stress. We need worry. Worry exists for a reason. It is a healthy, adaptive emotion the majority of the time that we experience it. So I think these are terrible gimmicks that are trying to sell somebody something that A, can never be delivered, and B, would be unhealthy even if it could be delivered. Uh, we got another polling question here. What's this one about? I don't even remember. What do you think it would take to conduct a thorough evaluation or an assessment in order to write an ESA letter? Like how much time, what number of appointments, or what methods do you think you should use? Well, you've kind of already answered that question. In fact, I might just kind of skip this one because we sort of dealt with that already. We've talked about how, you know, even in that one case in Florida, two hours was not enough. And we also talked about how one data source, the client's self-report is not sufficient. So that would mean that an over-the-phone evaluation with somebody with one phone call is insufficient also, right? But that's what you see online. Look at these reviews. Um, the entire process takes less than a week and everything's done. We can't wait to get our dog with us on the plane. Charlie also got to fly for free. Usually we have to pay $100. Thank you for great service. Um, but this one, super fast. And I got my letter the very next day. So one phone call with someone you've never met, and the next day you have a letter. Now, I realize from a marketing standpoint, this makes the company look really awesome from a customer service standpoint, right? We're fast, we're responsive, you're getting what you want. But from a clinician standpoint, this is really poor quality stuff that's going on that wouldn't stand up in court, would it? And so if you don't do a good job, you don't do your due diligence, and then that client loses their case, could they now sue you for malpractice? Could they say, you had a duty to me, and that duty included that you know the law about this, and that you know that you're competent to do it, and that you're using multiple data points, et cetera, and these are what your ethics codes say, and here's what best practice guidelines publishing journals say, and you didn't do those things, so you breached your duty to me, and because of that, I got evicted and I lost my emotional support animal and I spiraled with my depression and you see where this is going. So um, we also have to think about it from a civil standpoint. So uh, Dennis has brought up that, you know, it seems to be a conflict of interest when you're the therapist providing treatment, but you're also assessing you say, that's what some people believe that they say, there's two arguments I've heard for the opposite on this. One argument is, Therapists shouldn't even be doing this. It should be independent, objective evaluators. But the other argument is no, because the whole point is that you have an established ongoing therapeutic relationship with the person. And so you truly know them, whereas an evaluator might only get to see them a couple of times or something. So I've heard both arguments in both directions. But right now the law doesn't, in fact, the law seems to favor you're their therapist. Um, that you have an ongoing therapeutic relationship with them. That's the way it looks in the law right now, even though there's an ethical and clinical argument that there should be an independent evaluator who does this kind of work. And then what if you only meet for two sessions, but you use multiple assessments and collateral interviews via phone? So Christine, good question. Maybe that case that we saw, maybe if the psychologist if, had only done two appointments, yeah, but, you know, he administered six tests and some of them have validity scales built into them. And he reviewed medical records and he did interviews with other people. Maybe we would have seen a very different outcome. So maybe it's not as much about the number of sessions or the time spent. Maybe that's part of it because it'd be hard to make a case for a 15 minute phone call being due diligence. Right. But maybe it's even more about what did you do with that time? So or it's about both, really. I would say it's probably about both. Um, so a lot of these websites, they'll put, they'll have a letter template online that anybody can look at. But also the Department of Housing and Urban Development hates that. <laughs> and they've made that very clear 
and their guidelines, they they caution people to be highly skeptical when they see websites and especially websites with templates and things like that. So what are some good recommended practices then? Well, we have to assess whether this accommodation of an emotional support animal will lead to improvement in this client's condition, right? We gotta know that. And I also would argue that the long-term goal should be to not need DSA. That doesn't mean that you don't have the animal in your life. It means I don't need an emotional support animal in order to function. I benefit from having this animal. That should be the therapeutic goal, in my opinion. Because what is our idealized goal as therapists? Is it to make somebody dependent on somebody? Or is it to help people to maximize their independence in an interdependent society? So here's what I mean by that. Imagine that a client comes in, and let's say this is a 20-year-old, I don't know, let's say a 20-year-old female client presents for therapy. And she says, you know what? I love my boyfriend. He is the best thing ever. He is amazing and wonderful. We've been together for a whole two months. And he's just, my life is fireworks because of him. I need to make sure that he can sit on all of our therapy appointments because I get too panicky without him. And also, I really want, um, for my work, to let him come to work with me and to sit um, by my desk with me, because if he's not there, then I'm just not going to be able to function. I can't go on planes without him. I can't go on buses without him or get into cars without him. I can't leave the house without him. He has to be with me at all times. You need to help me make it so that he can have him me, that I can have him with me everywhere I go and in everything I do because I cannot function without them. Does that sound healthy to you? Probably it doesn't, right? Now, maybe that is what the client needs right now. Who knows? But wouldn't the goal be for that to not be the case? Doesn't that sound a little eerie? Some therapists, when I give that description, tell me they notice something in their body, a physical sensation in the pit of their stomach, something a little bit sort of gross or something mildly hinting at disgust maybe, or worry of some kind, it sounds really unhealthy, doesn't it? But isn't that, if we replace that with dog, I need this dog with me. Psychologically, I cannot function without it. I have to have it at all times. Why is that suddenly healthy when it wasn't healthy when it was a man that was needed? It's a good question, isn't it? So I'm not saying we shouldn't write ESA letters. I've written them. I'll tell you about cases where I think they're very legitimate in a moment. And I'm definitely not saying anything bad about service animals. I have the utmost respect for service animals and their use. But think about this. Do you really want your goal to be to foster dependency on this animal? Or do you want the ultimate long-term goal to be that this person has developed sufficient inner strength and coping skills so they do not need the animal, even if they have the animal, and even if the animal's helpful. So this dog right next to me right now is absolutely adorable and wonderful. Um, I love hanging out with him. Um, he adds happiness to my life. And yes, if I were feeling down or something, then probably just even sitting and grooming him would be tremendously helpful for me. Can I tell you honestly that I need this dog when I travel or that I need this dog at work? or that I need this dog to function, I can't tell you that. Not honestly, I can tell you I benefit from having this dog. So I can't have an ESA letter. I don't meet the requirements of the criteria for one. Uh, and if someone were to write one for me, I think that could actually be fostering a dysfunctional core belief that I need something that I do not need when I have what I need within me. All right, so next. Now your client may not be in that same boat though, right? So you would have to, you, that's part of why we do have legitimate cases of ESAs. So we have another point of view is looking at it from the animal side. They can actually become distressed if they sense that their owner is dependent on them or the control is transferred from owner to the dog. 
So the goal should be to move the animal back as pet status and not as support. I, I would tend to agree with you myself. So that's the first thing. The second thing is conduct a comprehensive disability determination evaluation. So you have to step aside from the question of the animal and the person's relationship with the animal temporarily. And you have to say, let me just see if there's even a disability here. And if there is a disability, how do I know that? And have I used measures that are designed to detect malingering or exaggeration or feigning of symptoms? So earlier, um, Christine posted some tools that she uses, which are great tools. I'm glad she uses them. And again, I think it's more than the average clinician uses, but also none of them had validity scales. So if I, if my goal was to malinger, I'd come in and I'll fill out a BDI and I'll say, oh yes, I have a hard time concentrating. I am sad all the time. I'm constantly thinking about death and dying. My appetite way off. My sleep, <laughs> what sleep? I'm not sleeping at all. And I'll just falsify all my answers. And then the BDI will come out being severely depressed, won't it? So it's not enough to use, in my opinion, self-report symptom screeners or tools that have no validity scales. So what I use, um, we'll show you in a moment, develop an evidence-based protocol for addressing ESA letter requests. So create a protocol, and then you can show that you're following that same protocol with every client. So you have a standard that you've identified, and that standard is backed by research or best practices. We'll show you some of those resources. So what are some tests you can use to detect possible malingering or to show a higher probability of it? I use the personality assessment inventory with every ESA letter request that I get. Why? Because it has an, it's like the MMPI, but I like it more than the MMPI. It has a wide range of clinical symptoms. So um, a, a lot of things that can be going on with a client are going to be measured by it, but it has validity scales and malingering scales. So if I see a giant spike on the NIM scale, negative impression management, and that tells me, wow, this person, there's a high probability that they're exaggerating symptoms. Then I'll say, hmm, I need to dig deeper. Now, maybe they still do meet the requirements for an ESA letter, but maybe not. Maybe they're just falsifying too much. So I might move on to the SERS 2, and that's a structured interview that I can use that one of you brought up in the chat box earlier that can show you a probability of feigning of symptoms in different categories. Another option is the SIMS. I've never used it myself, but some people use it. And there are probably a few others. But So I use this, and if I get a hit here, then I move on to this. Both of these require that you know how to administer and interpret that test. Both of them require level C testing qualification. Both of them cost money, which is part of why um, my assessments for ESA letter requests aren't going to be a, a, the, you know, incredibly cheap. I think they're reasonable given what's being done, certainly, but I'm going to have to compensate for the fact that this will cost me money to even give these kinds of tests. This is a free tool that you can use. Again, people can malinger their way through it if they want, but at least if these measures say probably not malingering or if so, maybe a little bit, and then these, this tool, you then can show, well, what specifically can they not do because of disability? Now I'm gonna show you what that tool looks like here. And um, yeah, I think all three of these are level C, Christine asked. Now probably mo most, if not all of you qualify for level C. But if you wanna know, go to mbfe.net, click on resources, then click on fair access to tests and read our report on counselors and testing and read what the level C requirements are for each uh, testing distributor. And probably you, you can buy these tests right now if you want to, but are you competent to use them? Maybe not. Um, so now I'm gonna violate what I said in, in my disclosures because I said, you know, I wasn't gonna bring up anything that I can benefit from financially. Well, I get a paycheck from MBFE and MBFE does have a testing workshop um, for people that you will learn how to use both of these tools in that workshop. And if you're interested in that, you can go to nbfe.net, click on training, 
and then on-demand webinars, and then the testing workshop. It's incredible because you actually score and interpret these tests and you send them in and they get reviewed and you get critiqued and coached until you're 100% accurate. So that's a, uh, that's a good way to, to, to get some extra competency with these kinds of things. The WHODAS though is free. It's really easy to learn how to administer and interpret. Um, on my YouTube channel, you can watch a free video on DSM-5 online assessment measures. And this is covered in that um, video. We also have, if you want CEs for it, there's a training on the on-demand webinars um, on free online assessment measures. But I didn't intend to tell you about those things, but spontaneously they've just popped up in my head based on the question about um, qualifications for testing. So, But take everything I tell you with a grain of salt because I do get a paycheck. I'm sorry, you can repeat where I can get training for the PA. Okay, so I'll put a couple of things into the chat box. First thing is to read about, most of you are counselors, like 60% of you are counselors, I think. To read about counselors and testing, visit nbfe.net, click resources, and then um, fair access to tests and read the analysis and position paper. It's the first link. The second thing is um, for in-depth training on administering tests, lots of typos, let me fix this in-depth. Training on administering tests, um, such as the PAI and the SERS2, um, visit, mbfa.net and click on training and then on-demand webinars and then um, testing for forensic populations. It is a very, if you did all four phases, it's a 40 hour course. And if you do all four phases, it's, um, it's not cheap. It's $1,500 if you do all four phases. Now, if you just want to do this, the phase one, which covers the PAI and the SERS two, then it's, I think, $400. And if you are a CFMHE or an applicant of our credential, you can do the whole workshop for $1,000 instead of $1,500, you get a $500 discount. So you'll see all that on the website when you go there. Um, but you can also research other training opportunities for learning how to administer and use those, those particular tests. And by the way, one forensic evaluation pays off, you know, the testing workshop. That's one thing you'll learn when you do forensic evals. Anyway, so the WHODAS, it's got all these categories. And then you have the client scale how much difficulty they have with each of these tasks. So it might be a task like um, uh, following directions, or it might be a task like um, being able to ambulate or self-ambulate or those kinds of things. And they rate how much trouble they're having in each. What I do is every time they answer one, then I ask them for specific examples and then I document those specific examples. So that if somebody asks me which impairments are posed by this person's disability, I can point to the exact ones on the HUDAS and I can give them exact examples, very specific ones. If we have time, I'll show you the HUDAS. We may run out of time though. We have a checklist only available to uh, people pursuing our credential though, that you can ask. Actually, no, we give you the checklist for attending this webinar. So it should be in your handouts folder. You'll see the checklist and you'll see sample letters in there. I might show you those in a minute. For the checklist, you it's confusing because there's a section on Air Carrier Access Act. So for that section, understand that no longer are ESAs protected for air travel. But if an airline chooses to allow ESAs to be treated as service animals, then you would use that section if that's what the point of your assessment is or your letter. Otherwise, disregard that section altogether. So let me give you a couple of good cases. In my opinion, they're good cases. I worked with a 15-year-old adolescent girl diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and major depressive disorder. She was very close to her family dog. She and her parents left for a high school sports competition out of state for a week, leaving the dog at a kennel. Upon return, the dog was acting strangely, so they took it to the vet, 
who prescribed an antibiotic and said the dog will be fine. But then when they brought their home, dog home, it was acting strangely, eventually started writhing in pain, coughing up blood, howling, and then eventually seizes and dies. The client witnessed the whole thing, was holding the dog during the seizure, like the whole nine yards, felt traumatized by it, blamed herself for leaving the dog at the kennel. This loss triggered a major depressive episode and the client participated in therapy. The client began recovering and a few months after the family bought a new dog. The client started to think and feel like she can't leave the dog alone for very long and became anxious when the dog was not around. The client attempted an overnight stay at her grandmother's home but returned home early due to panic. She used to always go to her grandma's home without any problem in the past. The client attempts an overnight stay with friends, gets through the night but was miserable the whole night and couldn't sleep. Client agrees with the therapist that it'd be best for her to work on coping with being away from her pet. So she's okay with the long-term goal of not having to have, you know, be there by the pet's side all the time. But in the meantime, she's requesting an ESA letter for a very limited purpose. She has another sports tournament coming. It's out of state. She's convinced she'll be unable to function for the event if her family pets, pets left at the kennel. She also doesn't want to force one of her parents to stay home and not be present for this major life milestone. She wants to be able to take the dog on the plane and in the hotel when staying out of town for this one occasion. This was back when ESAs were um, considered service animals on the plane. So I administered the adolescent version of the PAI. I did structured interviews. Like I, I did the BAI like Christine uses. I did the HUDAS adolescent version, both the parent and child version. So the parent can attest to which things the child is struggling with. I interviewed the mother for a corroboration source. I discussed with the client and her mom the potential benefits and drawbacks of the ESA. So I talked about, you know, we don't want to foster long-term dependence on the animal. And that's a potential drawback is that by having the animal with you at all times on this trip, we might be kind of temporarily feeding that in a way. But in my judgment, one of a few things has to happen based on where the client was at that time. Either she goes in the sports tournament and doesn't function and does terribly and then deals with the guilt and the depression exacerbation of letting her team down, or she stays home and lets her team down, or her mom has to stay home while she goes alone to all this stuff. And then she feels guilty because her mom missed out on this big giant once in a lifetime opportunity pivotal moment that she really wanted the whole family to be there for. So it was kind of like a rock and a hard place kind of scenario. So I wrote a one week ESA letter, clarifying an expiration on the letter. And we agreed to continue working on processes that inc incrementally in bearable ways has a client having less and less dependence on the animal in the long run. I think it's a good case because it was an established client who demonstrated motivation and therapeutic follow through. There was a thorough disability related assessment with multiple data points. There were objective measures used. There was a need demonstrated in relation to the vocational function of being a member of the sports team for the high school. There was a letter included with a limitation in the time frame. A long-term care had been considered and the implications were thoroughly explored. So there was good informed consent. Good case number two, though, that had a bad ending, though. 21-year-old male with severe depression, severe major depressive disorder, has suicidal ideation, failing courses in college, struggles to get out of bed, poor hygiene and activities of daily living, lack of appropriate exercise and nutrition, fatigue and amotivation, prescribed antidepressants and taking them, obtained a German Shepherd puppy and is now requesting an ESA letter for housing. I administered the PAI, the SIRS-2, the BEC, and the, a structured clinical interview called the MINI 7.02, and the HUDAS, like uh, some of the same tools that Christine mentioned earlier. Results, the results suggested some exaggeration, but probable syndromes at the same, same time. So the SIRS-2 will actually give you different levels, like you know just kind of blatant, all-out, ridiculous malingering to, well, they could be exaggerating some stuff. So there was some probable exaggeration going on, but also some probable syndromes. We obtained medical records. I got his academic records so I could see, was he really failing in college like he said he was? 
I interviewed his father who was funding his college and was very aware of his performance at school, as well as very aware of his depressive symptoms. And all of the sources of data align to suggest that once the client obtained that puppy, he started getting up each day out of bed. He started nourishing himself because when he fed his dog, he would feed himself. And he was getting exercise again and he was going to school and his grades had raised. Um, and all of this, we could draw some direct connections to having to take care of this German shepherd. The client reported a perception that caring for the dog enabled him to fake it till you make it. It worked for him. So I think this was a good case for a lot of reasons. The bad ending part is I had a suspicion in my head that once he got his letter, he was going to not show up for therapy because um, he seemed to be avoiding therapy, I thought. But when I look at all the requirements, legally, clinically, ethically, it looked to me like a pretty clear-cut case of an ESA letter, so I wrote it. But sure enough, not long after getting the letter, he said, you know, I'm going to research some options for continuing with therapy, and I'll let you know if I'm ready to schedule another appointment. And then he never contacted me again. So a year later, um, I get a contact from him because the letter was written to expire in a year. So a year later, he's like, I'm moving into a new place. I need another letter. Um, I was like, mm, what's been going on with you for the past year? So um, I told him I can do another assessment, but I'm not going to write another letter unless you're participating in therapy with somebody. Because if it's true that the symptoms are so severe that you need this accommodation, it's probably also true that you need therapy, which I recommended to you initially. And if you're avoiding that therapy, but only using the animal as your strategy, I'm concerned because what happens when the animal dies? What happens if the animal gets sick? Your entire life destabilizes because you don't have other coping strategies. Now I described it, um, you know, much even gentler than I did just now, but I really was trying to get the client to understand that there are drawbacks. We had a client, it, um, I was doing couples therapy with this client, but somebody else was doing the individual therapy. And the individual therapist wrote an ESA letter and the ESA died and she was like traumatized because the codependency on that animal is so strong. So she couldn't function, she spiraled, she became suicidal. There is a dark side to overdependency on an ESA. So I think it's important for us to know about that. But there are good clinical cases also. Now, I mentioned to you, if we had time, I'd spend a few minutes showing you something. First, I'm going to show you dsm5.org. Click on, um, you scroll down and you click on online assessment measures. dsm5.org, online assessment measures. That's where you're going to find lots of free screening tools. Again, they do not have validity scales. So they're just symptom screeners, but they're better than using nothing and they can help plot progress as well. And then disability measures, that's where you'll find the WHODAS. We do have um, on the MBFE website, you will see if you go to, uh, to trainings and then webinars on demand, this is the testing workshop I told you about, but also there is a Another one you may find helpful, it's like $30, I think. Or again, you can watch the video for free if you want. I'll give you the video for free if you just want the info. But it is uh, how to use online assessment measures. That includes some stuff on the WHODAS, including an Excel spreadsheet that um, just all kinds of stuff. Um, but all those measures that you see on that side I just showed you and how to use them are covered in this so that's only $15 members, dollars if you're a member, $20 if you're a non-member. And then let me go to, where else was it? Um, oh, here's a free resource that's good to know about. Resources and then fair access to tests. Here you'll see our position paper on counselors and psychological tests. So if you're a counselor and you're like, can, am, I, am I qualified for level C? Can I get those and start learning how to use them? If you don't already have that training anyway, and you're, you're wondering that, this would be a good read for you. And you can get an awful lot of information about counselors and testing on this 
um, analysis and position paper. So all that being said, I'm gonna give you one last polling question and then just open the floor for questions. I just realized something. I should also show you the templates that you have in your handouts folder. So this, these are the templates. You've got tons of stuff. You've got articles and position papers from associations. You've got the checklist here, the ESA letter checklist. But you also have sample letter templates and letters. So I'm going to show you an example here for housing, because that's primarily what you would be doing nowadays if you write an ESA letter. This is an example where I talk about the client being under my care since whatever date. This is, of course, fictitious names and things, but based on a real case. I mentioned this person has a disorder in the DSM-5 and it is a disability and that I am intimately familiar with their history and the functional limitations imposed by their disability. They meet the definition of disability as it appears under the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act. Um, I'm, by the way, a CRC, a Certified Rehabilitation Counselor. Some of you might be too, so I'm very accustomed to um, making determinations about disability and impediments. Due to her mental illness, Susan has certain limitations, including, and I listed those limitations here very specifically. You don't have to in your letter. You can just say she has limitations and not list them, but I was okay with that, and the client was okay with it, so we decided to list it. But you have to be aware could like this potentially trigger like illegal discrimination or something, depending on what you put here? Could it, you know, freak somebody out or something? So sometimes less information is better. In order to help alleviate these difficulties and to enhance her ability to live independently and to fully use and enjoy the dwelling unit you own or administer, I'm recommending, I don't say prescribing because that sounds like a medical doctor to me, but I'm recommending an emotional support animal that will assist her in coping with her disability. Susan's ESA is a black Labrador retriever named Roxy. So notice how specific we get. And her ESA alleviates identified symptoms that affect her disability. And my best clinical judgment, whether without her ESA, her symptoms will be significantly increased. Now here, I didn't identify the symptoms that are alleviated, but I have them in my file if I ever ended up in court. I'm licensed and then I give, you know, my licensure stuff and all the credentials and things. So that is an example. And I have templates that I parked in the handout folder. Oh, wow. It is one o'clock now. So hopefully you got what you were looking for. You got um, some resources to learn more. You understand the legal requirements, some ethical considerations and clinical considerations. You've been updated, hopefully. If there is an email that you didn't get or a question that you didn't get to, uh, just email me. You have the email address, Aaron at mbfe.net. It's in the chat box right now. And with that, I want to wish you all a very fulfilling weekend, but I will stay on for just a few more minutes in case there are people that had questions that they wanted to have answered but didn't. And the rest of you certainly can leave if you'd like. And remember to complete that evaluation survey. Keep your eyes peeled because we're going to be sending some announcements out for some really good trainings upcoming, and we'll see you next time. All right, Gary, you would like to know what was the website for the DSM test again? You go to dsm5.org, going to put it in the chat box right now. Then you click on online assessment measures, where, and there are multiple free screening tools there that are pretty easy to learn to administer, but then you also... the World Health Organization Disability Assessment Schedule. The WHODAS is one of the tools there that I really strongly recommend. I think that covers everybody's questions. Enjoy your weekend.